Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. So let me quickly drive you through the core technology of Algorand. So why are we here? Because blockchains had a great promise. Who doesn't like a tamper-proof you know, record? Who doesn't like transparency? Who doesn't like generating trust among people who barely know each other? The application and use cases are essentially unlimitedness. However, there is a little bit of an open secret. Blockchains, as defined, don't quite exist. All right? Because they've been very much aspirational and it's very good for humanity to raise our aspiration, to raise the bar. But if the technology does not allow us to achieve our aspirations, we are kind of in a bad place. So all this you know, event, you know, that every sociologist says, every anthropologist, decentralization is here, decentralization is here. Decentralization is not yet here at all. And in fact, if you, um, um, uh, if you look at an um, um, Ethereum co-founder um, um, pronouncement, the famous blockchain trilemma, analyze, analyzing the evidence of 2000 plus prior blockchain projects, what they figure out is say, hey, it ought to be a rule that in a blockchain you can at most satisfy two of the following three properties. Security, decentralization, scalability. You choose which one to exclude. It's like to say, welcome to blockchain by design. What property you don't want to have? Security, excellent choice. Really? If you don't have security, you have nothing. So, how about decentralization? If you don't like decentralization, why are you building a blockchain? And scalability, if you don't care about scalability, are you building a blockchain between friends and family? There are no good choices here. It's like to say, do you prefer to be shot in the left knee or in the right knee, okay? <laughs> no good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, the blockchain trilemma is not acceptable and, more importantly, is actually false. So what is instead the truth? The truth is that blockchains are very technological products and we need the better technology to realize our aspiration, okay? So what is the challenge? There are two aspects on a blockchain. Make sure that things are concatenated well and guess what? At this point, click, check mark, we already know how to do it. You take the hash of a previous block, you make a part of the current block, and nobody can tamper with the chain anymore. Everybody does that. But the, the difficulty is that who chooses the next block? Because when things are decentralized, transactions are actually um, um, propagated throughout the network, what you think ought to be the next page, and what I think is going to be the next page in this ledger is quite different. So who has the right to choose the next block? So there are uh, uh, popular prior approaches, right? The oldest one is uh, proof of work, you know, really a great idea at the time, and you know, hat off to Mr. or Mrs. Nakamoro, or the Nakamoros, or many they are. And what is the idea? We create a competition, a computational competition. Try to solve a crypto riddle, the first one who arrives there has the right to append the block. What are the cons? Extreme expenditures, right? In fact, waste of any resources that is inside. That is, that, that is bad. On top of it, these things are slow. They produce a block every 10 minutes. Why? Because if you try to make the riddle softer so that you can solve the riddle once a minute, then the chance that two people solve it a few seconds of each other increases so much that you are going to fork and fork and fork all the day. So personally, I understand expensive and fast. Expensive and slow is harder to understand. And on top of it, the expenditures needed, for, the capital needed for, doing, uh, for, for buying the mining equipment is such that very few people, fewer and fewer people participate. And right now, um, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain is actually dominated by just the free mining pools. You know what? Slow, expensive, and actually de facto centralized, perhaps we need a better idea. So delegated proof of stake, what is this? Very simple idea. We just put in charge, say, 21 people who look honest, look how honest they look, perhaps we will remain honest. They will choose the block on behalf of all of us. Is this decentralized? No. Okay. And because even if the people are actually very honest and remain honest, a denial of service attack against 21 people, you can deny of service even to a thousand people. That is, doesn't look too promising to me. Okay, next stop. Bonded proof of stake. What is this? Oh, that is a, another uh, uh, simple idea. You say you push some money in the middle of the table where you cannot touch it. 
And anybody can put the, the money in the middle of a table, and the people who willingly put it there, hostage, are the ones who choose the block on behalf of all of us. And if they misbehave, their money is confiscated. Wow, this should work, right? Does it? Let me ask a simpler question. How much of your disposable income can you afford to put in the middle of a table, hostage? And the answer is a very small fraction. So in a system like this, not only do you make it possible, but you make it easy for big thieves with deep pockets to put a disproportionate amount of money in the middle of the table for the sole purpose of controlling the blockchain. But so what if they misbehave, their money is confiscated? Let me tell you. Speaking about the borderless economy, the borderless economy should secure a trillions of dollars, okay? A, a very secure, decentralized, scalable blockchain is trillions of assets under management. And so by misbehaving, you can make a billion dollars or two very easily. So do you think these guys care if they confiscate their 10 or 100 million dollars? No, that's just the price of doing business, the cost of doing business, right? So in other words, if you look at all these prior approaches, they have a strange logic. The logic goes like this. The whole economy is secure if the majority of the members of this small corner of the economy are honest. Where is this small corner? In Bitcoin, the miners, right? In uh, delegated proof of stake, the 21 delegates. So Algorand takes a quite different logic. The whole economy is secure and works if the majority of the members of the economy are honest. And that is um, where you want to go. Right? Always dangerous to put a big thing in, 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 in very few hands who don't really have a lot of, of money in the system. So let me tell you what we are based on is pure proof of stake. There are many versions of pure proof of stake. That's our own brand, pure proof of stake. What does it mean? That first of all, we don't punish anybody. Why? Because we believe that making cheating impossible is way better than pursuing somebody who has been an imposing a fine or somebody who is running to the Bahamas with uh, the goods, okay? That's a bad idea. So where is the money in Algorand? It's always where it should be. In your wallet, at your fingertips, ready to be spent, invested in the various financial tools that blockchain um, has, offers you. And if you consider all this money, wherever it happens to be, if the majority of the money is in honest hands, the system is secure, period, okay? So, um, so better within, uh, secure against whom? Against a, a bad adversary. How bad? Very bad. So this guy is really scary because uh, the system remains secure, even an adversary can immediately corrupt any players he wants instantaneously and can perfectly coordinate the players. And by the way, he can attack not only the protocol, but also the communication network on which the protocol is run. What does it mean? People, when they discuss the security, most of the time they refer to, are you sending the messages that the protocol tells you to send? If I'm an adversary, no, I'm not. I have better things to do. But as an adversary, you have all kinds of other things to do. How about attacking the routers, so disconnecting the network? And in systems like Bitcoin, you can actually collapse the system if you attack the network. So we are going to remain secure against an adversary who can attack the protocol and the network. Do we need to be so adversarial, or is it me that I'm a cryptographer? Well, as a cryptographer, I'm actually a realist, because remember, if something is worth a trillion dollars and up, then it's going to be attacked. In fact, attackers are going to come up as mushrooms after the rain, right? So we must be really prepared. So what, how do we achieve all this poverty, decentralization, scalability, security? Essentially, is the following. In Algorand blockchain, the blockchain is grown by a sequence of ever-changing committee. In fact, each committee, think of it like, uh, consists of a thousand randomly and independently selected users. And what do these selected users do? Oh, they do a simple thing. They utter a single message, short and very easy to compute. And then another different thousand people come over, right? That's the way it works. So, well, let's say, gee, Silvio, at this high level of description, I have a few questions. A few, you should have many questions, but we have time for one, the most popular one which is, who selects the committee? Good question. Let's assume that, that my answer is, I do. When you say, well, this is the most decentralized blockchain I ever saw, and you are at the center of it. That's not what we do. How about if I tell you, well, humanity gets together, we debate, and together select a thousand people committee, who then, uh, really? 
the humanity cannot agree on anything at all, let alone a thousand people committee. So what do we do? In Algorand, we do something a little bit counterintuitive. The committee members select themselves. We go, what? That is a terrible idea. In fact, is the first worst idea, or maybe the second worst idea I ever saw, because if I'm a bad guy, of course I will select myself for this committee, and the next, and the one after this, and so on and so forth. But not so fast. Why? Because in order to select yourself, you must actually win an individual lottery disconnected from the rest of the world, in the privacy of your computers. You have to run a lottery to see, am I part of the next committee? In case one, if you win, you obtain a winning ticket, a short proof that me, tell, can tell, everybody can verify you are part of this committee. And if you don't win, you can say anything you want, nobody pays attention, okay? So what is, uh, that, that is uh, the idea? And that this cryptographic uh, lottery is such that not even a national state with huge computational resources can enhance even by bit, a little bit, the probability of being selected, okay? So essentially, if you want to have a million users initially, you want to select a thousand, the lottery sets the threshold of winning at one in a thousand because a million divided by a thousand is a thousand. But later on, we can have billions. See if I care. We, automatically, the system selects the threshold to be one in a million because a billion divided a million is a thousand. That's the way it goes, right? All right. And of course, you know, the probability of winning is proportional to the total amount uh, of money that, that you have, because otherwise, right, I can distribute the, the Silvio key into a million Silvio keys, Silvio 1, Silvio 2, and if anyone wins, I win. But in Algorand, if you have a million algos, whether you keep them in one key or one algo for a million keys, the probability of being selected is absolutely identical. So no civil attacks. Now let me tell you why this is super decentralized. Of course it's super decentralized, because we are not have a fixed committee that runs our affair for a month, or for a week, or for a day, or for an hour, or not even a minute, because in a minute, the denial of service attack <laughs> catches you very fast. So, your turn, a thousand, then another thousand people next time, and another thousand people next time. And only they stay in power, they say one message only. Okay, check, that is decentralized. Now let me argue that this system is super scalable. How long does it take to do the lottery to figure out if you're a member? One microsecond. That's very fast. Okay, but now that you have this thousand uh, people selected in a microsecond, what do you have to do? Well, all I have to do is to propagate a single short message. Can we do that? Yeah, yes. That's our network. It's a piece of cake. So that's why it scales, right? And so the important thing is that even with billions of users, the committee never needs to be more than a thousand, but it changes all the time. And now, let me argue finally why the system is super secure. Assume that I have the big scary guy that I just showed you, right? I can corrupt anybody I want, right? Very, very quickly, instantaneously even. But I have a problem. Whom should I corrupt? Should I corrupt you or you or this lady down in the street, this guy in Paris? I don't know. Why? Because you, only you know if you have won your own lottery. I don't. You run the lottery inside your own machine, right? So that's the whole idea. But if you win, you propagate your winning ticket and your uh, message, right? Let's say up and down message, you think of it. There. At this point, I know who you are. And what am I going to do? I'm going to zap you right away, to corrupt you instantaneously. But so what? Whatever you had to say, you already said it. And it's virally propagating throughout the network. And I cannot put it back into the bottle, no more than the US government can put back in the bottle a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. In other words, Algorand is secure because beforehand you have no idea whom you should corrupt, and ex post, once you know, it's too late to corrupt them. And in, in some sense, I want, this is not a mathematical proof, but that is the idea that was missing to actually solve the trilemma. You have to do that sometimes, the, right, the straight path is a torturous one. Okay, so let me tell you in, a, in action what happens. The difficulty is that a blockchain is to select the next block, right? That's what I said. But one block is not easy to, <laughs> is not hard to select at all, which is the genesis block, block number one, because it's part of the very definition of the system. And so next to the block, I want to observe a favor, a universal symbol of lightness and effortlessness. And as this 
favor effortlessly falls to the ground, the Algorand blockchain unfolds. Well, isn't this too simple? How about soft forks? How about proof of work? Well, guess what? In Algorand, there are no soft forks. There is no proof of work. And these are great advantages. Why? Because the absence of soft forks, the fact that the Algorand chain never forks, is, gives you transaction finality. You can consider yourself paid if a payment to you appears in the block. As soon as the block is appear, ship the good. Because this block is never going to leave the blockchain. And uh, to have such effortless means no proof of work, anybody can participate. In fact, we want you to participate. That is the, the, the part of Algorand. And so this is the core. And then let me tell you that you know, one reason to have a great team is that we have a very deep roadmap. We are going to unfold all kinds of things in addition to the core. And um, here there are some of them. One thing I'd like to highlight, and maybe uh, two, one is uh, Dutch auctions. What does this mean? We are going to having the value to the network through equity fundraising, not uh, crowdfunding. Now the network is ready. We are going to, once, once we la launch it, we are going to make our uh, tokens available to you by a sequence of Dutch auctions. Why? Because assume the typical project, what does it do? Say, they fix a price, right? One token, I make it up, $2, okay? So you can ask, sorry, is this a fair price? What? This is the wrong question. So how many tokens you want to get out of here, right? In fact, it's a, in fact, instead in a Dutch auction, what is going to happen that you may decide the price for the algo token, not us. So, and I think we want the best to be fairly, consider yourself fairly treated, all the time you are in Algorand, starting from your first entering the Algorand schedule system, when you buy your first token. Okay? And by the way, these are not Dutch auctions have been used now for a long time. Who uses them? Governments to offer their bonds, right? But to whom? To the usual suspects. Goldman Sachs, Bank of America. And what do they do? They buy them and then they resell at higher prices to all of us, right? So here instead, the bits are on-chain auction is not in a smoke room, right? So you can see the bids of yours and the bids of everybody else. You know that you are paying the right price. You know that you are fairly won this number of tokens. And you directly participate. These are massive online, on-chain, on public conducted auctions. And if we offer this to sell this tool for selling our tokens, you can use it to sell your building. You can use it to sell whatever assets you want. And just think about if you are a, a builder and you have an office building and you allow somebody from very far away through a Dutch auction to buy just, you know, to put a, the, the equivalent of $10,000 to get a very small piece of the building. You don't have, I don't have this opportunity to build <laughs> on an office building in Shanghai and vice versa. And, uh, and vice versa, the builder never had such an opportunity to cast such a wide net to really realize the value of whatever he or she has built. And the other thing I want to tell you is uh, self-governance, which is really the missing ingredient, the most cooling ingredient in, in, in most blockchains. Why? Because we don't know what we re our needs are going to be tomorrow. We barely know what we need today, right? But tomorrow, who knows? And so, if you look at our, the way Algorand protocol works, is that you reach agreement, consensus on each block by block by block. But the mechanism that we use to reach consensus on a block is the same mechanism that can be used to reach agreement on a new monetary policy or a new rule in the protocol. And so we have the ability to evolve in a consensual manner. And I really believe that being life, essentially, about intelligent adaptation, that is what really is, uh, uh, in, in my opinion, is the number one uh, prize of, of all this. Of the king of properties. And, but all these tokens together, smart, smart contracts. Why smart square? Because smart contracts are not that smart, are they? Right? You cannot have you know, an ICO and a crypto kitten you know, at the same time. How smart can they be? So, but you need all these things to really realize what is our dream, and I hope your dream, to have a borderless economy. So in conclusion, I mean, we really should be thanked all of our great project out there, and they've picked up a very high challenge. And some of them, blockchains, it's not going to be a win for all. Some of them are going to stay around and prove useful for, uh, uh, to, uh, for a while, too. But only through technology we really realize our aspirations. And speaking of technology, here is some technology 
that old technology, but for 2,000 years, the Pont du Gard, right, is an old Roman bridge in, uh, in uh, southern France, has enabled occupants of different sides of a river to transact and meet each other, right? And has been in continual operation 2,000 years. I mean, hat off, that is what technology can do us to bring us together. I believe that the, the blockchain, the permissionless blockchain, is going to be as useful to cement and bridge each other as humanity, and as beautiful as any other physical infrastructure that you ever build. And it will last for a long, long time too. So ladies and gentlemen, let's bring to get together the right blockchain and enjoy it for a long time to come. Thanks.